Okay, hi everybody and welcome. My name is Leslie Larkin. I'm a professor in the English department here at NMU and I'm really delighted to welcome you to today's event, Between the World and Me in Conversation. Um, today's panel is the inaugural event for this year's Diversity Common Reader Program and it was developed in collaboration with United, the Department of Theater and Dance and the North by North Coast Arts and Culture Festival. The Diversity Common Reader Program is a co-curricular interdisciplinary program focused on issues of justice and diversity raised by an accessible and engaging nonfiction work. This year's book selection is ta Coates's Between the World and Me, published in 2015. Working squarely within the prophetic tradition of literary giants like James Baldwin and Richard Wright, Coates explores what it means to live in a black body in America. This book folds trenchant social critique into an intimate letter addressed to the author's son and is a singular and deeply compelling treatment of issues at the heart of the anti-racist protests that have defined 2020. And I'm really honored to help facilitate conversations about this book in our community this year. And today's panel is just the start of that conversation. Over the break, the Diversity Common Reader Program will hold a winter break book club and there will be a series of events next semester. So please watch for announcements about those. Um, meanwhile, NMU students can pick up a free copy of Between the World and Me at the library, at the English department, at Disability Services, the Merck office, or the Center for Student Enrichment. You can also request an ebook in Kindle format. And if you're interested in doing that, you can send me an email. I'm pretty easy to find um, on the NMU website. Again, it's Leslie Larkin. I'm Larkin at nmu.edu. Um, I also want to take a minute to acknowledge our sponsors, uh, which include the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, the Department of English, the Department of Theater and Dance, the College of Graduate Education and Research, the College of Business, the School of Education, Leadership and Public Service, the Lydia M. Olson Library, and Sigma Tau Delta, the English Honor Society, as well as the many faculty, staff, and students who've been ser serving on our committee uh, this year. Now I'm really delighted to introduce my colleague, Dr. Keenan Colquitt, who will be guiding today's conversation. And Dr. Colquitt is an enthusiastic educator with experience in student affairs administration, gender studies, assessment, and management. His research interests include gender identity development, masculinity, and gender socialization in college men. Um, in addition, Keenan studies men's violence, um, factors that motivate men to challenge toxic masculinity, and how discourse in, uh, informs men's gendered behavior. Keenan received his bachelor's degree in psychology from Grand Valley State University, a master's in human resource management from Stony Brook University, and a PhD in higher education administration from Bowling Green State University. And in addition, he's got a graduate certificate um, in gender, women's gender and sexuality studies from uh, Bowling Green. Dr. Colquitt currently teaches student development theory, history of higher education and politics of higher education here at NMU. And I'm really delighted to turn uh, the, the Zoom reins over to you. So thank you, Dr. Colquitt. Thank you very much, Leslie. Um, again, my name is Kenan. I use he, him, his pronouns. I usually have it in my list to go through and give a little bit of an intro of myself, but that was already done, so we're just gonna run straight into this wonderful panel I'm really excited about today. Just for everyone's understanding, we have several panelists. Each of the panelists will take five to seven minutes to introduce themselves. Um, then they'll read a passage from uh, the book and uh, they'll respond to that passage. Though, um, after introducing themselves and completing this task, we'll kind of do a popcorn where they'll go from Hi, my name is David, and then, all right, I'm done, and David will kick it over to Josie, whomever. So we're going to go ahead, go ahead and get started, and we'll start with the dynamic duo right there. Lissandra, if we can get started. Yeah, do you want me to introduce myself and share my passage first? Please. Or just introduce? Please introduce yourself, share your passage, and then give a little bit of a rundown of it. My name is Lisandra Perez. I am in my first year of the MFA program here. I'm studying poetry. Um, I'm from Chicago, currently here. Um, and I'm going to be reading from Tanahasi Coates' uh, book, Between the World and Me, from page nine. Um, all right, I'll just start my reading. I write you in your 15th year. I am writing you because this was the year you saw Eric Garner choked to death for selling cigarettes. 
because you know now that Renisha McBride was shot for seeking help, that John Crawford was shot down for browsing in a department store. And you have seen men in uniform drive by and murder to Mayor Rice, a 12 year old child whom they were oath bound to protect. And you have seen men in the same uniforms pummel Marlene Pinnock, someone's grandmother on the side of a road. And you know now, if you did not know before, that the police departments of your country have been endowed with the authority to destroy your body. It does not matter if the destruction is the result of an unfortunate overreaction. It does not matter if it originates in a misunderstanding. It does not matter if the destruction springs from a foolish policy, sell cigarettes without the proper authority, and your body can be destroyed. Resent the people trying to entrap your body and it can be destroyed. Turn it into a dark stairwell and your body can be destroyed. The destroyers will rarely be held accountable. Mostly they will receive pensions and destruction is merely the superlative form of a dominion whose prerogatives include friskings, detainings, beatings and humiliations. All of this is common to black people and all of this is old for black people. No one is held responsible. There is nothing uniquely evil in these destroyers or even in this moment. The destroyers are merely men enforcing the whims of our country, correctly interpreting its heritage and legacy. It is hard to face this, but all our phrasing, race relations, racial chasm, racial justice, racial profiling, white privilege, even white supremacy, serves to obscure that racism is a visceral experience, that it dislodges brains, blocks airways, rips muscle, extracts organs, cracks bones, breaks teeth. You must never look away from this. You must always remember that the sociology, the history, the economics, the graphs, the charts, the regressions all land with great violence upon the body. So that's one of my favorite um, passages from the book. Um, it's for many reasons. We. We are forced as readers to read the names that have been taking, taken at the lives of police. And we are forced to, to humanize them in our breath. And that's why I like this part because what, whatever kind of reader you are, you have to say their name. And I, I am adamant about saying the names of people who have been lost due to police violence. And ta Coates is reminding, especially the readers, because I think this is a very digestible book it's reminding the readers that we cannot forget about these people, especially when he writes, um, you must never look away from this. You must always remember that this exists. This great violence upon the body exists. You know, um, it, it, there is a lot in just um, putting a little circle banner on our profile picture saying Black Lives Matter, but that's not enough. Like, we can't just stop there. And I think this book does, in that passage specifically, it reminds us of like why we're fighting. We're not fighting for the a public acclaim of being labeled a BLM supporter. That's not right. You know, this diversity panel is not enough and this will never be enough. Um, and that's why I really appreciate this book because it's like, it reminds us that the work is never done and there's always work to be done. Um, and I think it's a, it's a great reminder to us, especially in a digital age where we're just consuming and we're just um, labeling ourselves as like black activists or um, black allies. And what does that really mean? You know, how are we actually putting those words into action, into fruition? And I think um, this just this passage, again, it just it's a really helpful reminder that we cannot stop at just a little label on our Facebook profile pictures. So that was my passage. Um, would you like to go? <laughs> um, hi, so my name is Esperanza Vargas Macias. I'm a first year in the English department. Um, I'm also doing my MFA in fiction. Um, and like Lise, I taught this book in my um, EN 111 class. Um, so I'll read my favorite passage. Um, this is on page 69. Um, and I'll just start, okay. I have raised you to respect every human being as singular, and you must extend that same respect into the past. Slavery is not an indefinable mass of flesh. It is a particular specific enslaved woman whose mind is as active as your own, whose range of feeling is as vast as your own, who prefers the way the light falls in one particular spot in the woods, who enjoys fishing where the water eddies in a nearby stream, 
who loves her mother in her own complicated way, thinks her sister talks too loud, has a favorite cousin, a favorite season, who excels in dressmaking and knows inside herself that she is as intelligent and capable as anyone. Slavery is this same woman born in a world that loudly proclaims its love of freedom and inscribes this love in its essential texts. A world in which these same professors hold this woman a slave, hold her mother a slave, her father a slave, her daughter a slave. And when this woman peers back into the generations, all she can see is the enslaved. She can hope for more. She can imagine some future for her grandchildren. But when she dies, the world, which is really the only world she can ever know, ends. For this woman, enslavement is not a parable. It is damnation. It is a never ending night. And the length of that night is most of our history. Never forget that we were enslaved in this country longer than we have been free. Never forget that for 250 years, black people were born into chains, whole generations followed by more generations who knew nothing but chains. Um, so I'll just like read off my phone because I'm not as articulate on the fly. <laughs> um, so I chose this quote because when I read it, I felt like I truly understood for the first time the inhumanity of slavery. There has never been any doubt in my mind that the enslavement of black people in America is an atrocity, an injustice that can never be corrected. I knew that slavery was violent and cruel. As Ta-Nehisi Coates explains on page 103, he says, enslavement must be casual wrath and random mangling, the gashing of heads and brains blown out over the river as it seeks to escape. It must be rape so regular as to be industrial. The soul was the body that fed the tobacco and the spirit was the blood that watered the cotton and these created the first fruits of the American garden. And the fruits were secured through the bashing of children with stove wood, through hot iron peeling skin away like husk from corn. Even knowing all this, I feel like a lot of people have become desensitized and I think I've been guilty of this as well. Violence is business as usual in America. And because we are desensitized, I feel like we can't truly begin to comprehend the violence of slavery and what that must have felt like. It's difficult to understand and impossible to quantify how much pain countless of enslaved black people suffered at the hands of white people. We can't even come close. So when I read this quote, when ta Coates made that pain accessible by portraying one single black woman, when he humanized her and made her relatable by giving her thoughts and feelings like our own, when he illustrated how she and the generations before and after her, her family, could never know freedom and would only ever know chains, I felt like I could finally grasp the feeling a little more clearly. I know that I will never truly understand the extent of pain and suffering black people went through for 250 years. But when I read this passage, I realized that I had at least begun to know their pain in a way I did not before. Um, okay, so those are my thoughts. Um, can I pass it on to Josie? They're right next to me. <laughs> All right, I'm next. Hello, everyone. My name is Josie. I'm well, Jocelyn Campos. I go by Josie. My pronouns today are they, them. Um, and my passage was similar to Lisandra's, where basically it's the second part. So I'm still gonna read it because it's still a very powerful passage. And I, if we have to repeat it several times, I think it's still extremely valuable. So um, here we go. It is hard to face this, but all of our phrasing, race relations, race chassism, racial justice, racial profiling, white privilege, even white supremacy, serves to obscure that racism is a visceral experience that it dislodges brains, blocks airways, rips muscle, extracts organs, cracks bones, breaks teeth. You must never look away from this. You must always remember that the sociology, the history, the economics, the graphs, the charts, the regressions, all land with gray violence upon the body. And I'm gonna read also too from a short blurb, I think because there's a lot of things that I always wanna say. And I think when it comes to these kinds of subjects, I get overwhelmed and I wanna make sure that I'm as clear as possible, you know? so. It is a compelling passage that reminds us and reminds each and every one of us that racism and the syndicate that maintains and enforces it isn't some phantom lurking in the depths of neo-Nazi and proud boy brains. It's the government officials that pass laws. It's the marketing executives that advertise it. It's the employers who pay less. It's the principals who punish students for their supposedly unprofessional Afro hair. And the neighbor who calls black people thugs for demanding police officers not be the judge, jury, and executioner at routine traffic stops. It's the 72,300,000 Americans who voted for, 
who saw the President of the United States tweet a video of his supporters yelling white power and voted him to have him reelected. Racism is a visceral and violent experience. May we never forget that when we say racial justice, it means that Native Americans are 1.4 times more likely to die of COVID-19. That Black or African American people are two times more likely to die of COVID-19. That Latina people are 1.1 more times likely to die of COVID-19. I think ta Coats Coates reminds non-Black people that racism is not only word, it's violence. We as a community need to reevaluate what violence and violent acts mean to us and not let cognitive dissonance stop us from realizing the inherent violence of our ruling systems. Books, I think just kind of like a free word summary of that, that all of these words, they're not just words. Discourse has a direct effect, right? On our everyday lives. That an act of a law passing mean is violent. Slavery was legal. Redlining was legal. All of these racist uh, oppressions or racist government is legal. It is legal for a police officer to kill Tamir Rice in cold blood. That is all legal. So we need to reevaluate what violence means to us. That calling black people thugs for protesting, that calling protesters rioters, that's violence. And I do not want to take away from the fact and realizing and analyzing what violence means to us. And that's basically what I wanted to take away from that, right? It's not enough to put a poster or not enough to have a panel. There's actual actions that need to be taken, but also we need to reevaluate what it is to be violent, what it is to have a government control, what violence means to us. So those are my two cents, especially from what I took away from this book, amongst other things. Um, I think I'd love to hear David speak too after. He's your next up on my square, <laughs> not to push you. Well, uh, it's my turn, I guess. Um, hi, everyone. I'm David Robinson. I'm a second year MA here at NMU. I'm also a grad. Um, I'm a grad assistant, so I teach 211, and I'll be teaching it next semester. And my primary focus, or my like, where I like what I study is contemporary African American literature, uh, 21st century um, 20 and 20th century literature. Um, particularly those uh, concerning like mixed race individuals, um, something I'm very interested in. So I'm going to read um, from page 71, the last paragraph of page 71 um, of Ta-Nehisi Coates's piece. So I'll begin. The birth of a better world is not ultimately up to you, though I know each day there are grown men and women who would tell you otherwise. The world needs saving precisely because of the actions of these same men and women. I am not a cynic. I love you and I love the world and I love it much more with every new inch I discover. But you are a black boy and you must be responsible for your body in a way that other boys cannot know. Indeed, you must be responsible for the worst actions of other black bodies, which somehow will always be assigned to you. And you must be responsible for the bodies of the powerful, the policeman who cracks you with a nightstick who will quickly find his excuse in your furtive movements and this is not reducible to just you. The women around you must, must be responsible for their bodies in a way that you will never know. You, ha you have to make your peace with the chaos, but, but you cannot lie. You cannot forget how much they took from us and how they transfigured our very bodies into sugar, tobacco, cotton, and gold. Sorry, I have a terrible stutter. But anyway, um, I, I love that passage because after reading it, I, uh, like, I'm not teaching this book in my class, but I read that passage and it makes me think of something my father used to say to me all the time. Um, so the passage, right, I chose today reflects the problem of the black community, a problem that has been quantified and vilified by the dominant culture since the civil rights movement. And before that, my father used to tell me the same thing Coates is saying before his passing. He used to tell me that black men in this country have had nothing and will ha have had nothing and will have nothing. Our black sister is even less so. I remember clearly telling him that that is not true. We do have something. Um, it's a type of resentment toward ourselves and the, the man, the dominant culture. And we used to bicker about this constantly um, for a while. Um, but this problem that Coates is addressing, it is something that's uh, deeply rooted in the culture of Black America and America proper. This signification or racialization of skin and its influence on or vulnerability to action and or violence 
This codification of black skin is a detriment to the condition of the black community. This symbolic order, the repetition of utterances or actions which ingrain themselves in the psyche of culture plagues us all and tells us a problem, but not the problem. And codes throughout this piece addresses this for us. The people who say that we need to do the, sorry, the people who say what we need to do to change are indeed the same people hoping, praying for us to fail, to kill ourselves, which will ultimately uphold the status quo. The police officer who knocks us upside our heads and the people watching will tell us that it is our fault and our fault alone that our head is cracked open and spilt all over the sidewalk. However, Coates does not put uh, place the burden of fixing this problem upon his son nor the new generation of black Americans. He instead instructs us to subvert the symbolic order that it hangs over us like a miasma to show and explain to others that this, this mere concept of the symbolic order is why we are killing ourselves. Explain and explain why our history, our oppression and our displacement undoes us to undo the rhetoric that binds all black people in this country. So that's, so I think about that a lot when, when reading codes. So that's, that's my two cents. Um, so the next person to me is Aaron. So thank you. Um, all right, my name is Erin Culp. I am a senior this year, completing my at undergrad, uh, and I am a psychology and theater uh, double major. Um, <clears throat> my passage, although brief, acknowledges those of us who are caught in the dream by stating, you have not yet grappled with your own myths and narratives and discovered the plunder everywhere around us. I wanted to expand on this concept because I know that there was a time when I had also been blinded by uh, these myths and false narratives. And it wasn't until I really started trying to further uh, my education by reading and research and participating in events like this, that I began to see how blatant um, some of these uh, systemic inequalities are, or all of these. Um, I, for example, I attended a predominantly white school growing up. I never had a black teacher. My education consisted of analyzing F. Scott Fitzgerald's uh, interpretation of the American dream uh, in uh, Great Gatsby, for example. Um, and which is essentially that anyone can earn success, wealth, and the American dream if they work hard enough, which obviously is not true. Um, what Scott Fitzgerald, who was a white drunk man while he was writing this book in the first place, uh, what, his, uh, what he failed to acknowledge uh, about the American dream is the privilege and the cost that is attached to it. Um, Coates' interpretation of the dream acknowledges its existence and its glamour, but not from the point of view of having experienced it. Through his passages, he describes in heartfelt detail that his perspective of the world and how those who've achieved the dream are blinded by it. And I would like to attest for this. As a white woman, I've grown up dependent on my privilege and I feel that my earlier education has set me and many others at a disadvantage when considering social, economic and systemic inequalities throughout uh, the world. Um, and I guess, what I took from that is all the uh, from this passage is um, although we're all still learning, uh, I'm beginning to understand what it feels like to wake up from this dream that he is acknowledging, um, and I'm also able to notice other people still in it, um, which is what he's saying uh, in that passage. Not, grap uh, not grappling with the myths and narratives and discovering the actual world around us and the suffering. And that's all, thank you. Uh, all right, I'll go next. I'm Demario. Uh, I'm a June, third year medicinal plant chemistry major. Uh, I'm the current president of Black Student Union and I'm also from Kenosha, Wisconsin. And I, before I say my passage, I just want to say like seeing that happen really changed how I took the Black Lives Matter movement. Cause like you see it on the news and you see all these people dying and then it, it's just kind of there, but then it happened in my hometown and that truly made me realize that this shit is everywhere. Like it's everywhere. It's not just a major city problem. It's not just a, 
It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Okay. Uh, the passage I wanted to share is on page 40, and it's Ta-Nehisi Coates talking about Howard University. He said, uh, I was admitted to Howard University, but formed and shaped by the Mecca. These institutions are related, but not the same. Howard University is an institution of higher education concerned with the LSAT, magna cum laude, and Phi Beta Kappa. The Mecca is a machine crafted to capture and concentrate the dark energy of all African peoples and inject it directly into the student body. The Mecca derives its power from the heritage of Howard University, which in Jim Crow's days enjoyed a near monopoly on black talent. And whereas most other historical black schools were scattered like forts in the great wilderness of the old Confederacy, Howard was in Washington DC, Chocolate City, and thus in proximity to both federal power and black power. The result was an alumni and professorate that spanned genre and generations, Charles Drew, Amir Baraka, Thurgood Marshall, Ossie Davis, Doug Wilder, David Dickens, Lucille Clifton, Toni Morrison, Kwame Tour, Tour. The history, the location, the alumni combined to create the Mecca, the crossroads of the black diaspora. Um, I chose this quote because I read that and I couldn't fathom it. Like I could not imagine walking across a campus and seeing all black faces and seeing them Africans, Americans from all over the world in higher education. And it, honestly, it just made me want to go see it for myself. And then I was watching a, a speech earlier from Martin Luther King giving a speech at Howard University and he was talking about how they made him an honorary alumni. And it's just like, I don't know, I'd like to be able to see that place for myself to be able to walk among some of the most influential black people on earth. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you all for your passages for your contributions and your sharing. There's a lot of uh, vulnerability attached to everything that you said. I want to appreciate that and acknowledge it. So we have opportunity for questions for our panelists. Um, I'm also available, available to answer and respond to questions as well. But I have some pre-prepared. Feel free to take a look at the chat for instructions on how to ask questions if you're interested. So let's get started. I am drawn to Coates' discussion of the dream. Um, Coates mentions the dream often. Aaron, I know that you uh, mentioned this as well. Um, can you speak a little bit more about the dream? What are your impressions of the notion of the dream? And how does it really fit into what we're doing right now, how we're existing in the world right now? Yeah. So. Um... When I, I looked back into uh, his material and tried to look at a couple um, of times when he refers to the dream, um, and I didn't include whole sentences or anything, but I just wrote down a couple things. Uh, I wrote, within a country lost in a dream, and uh, there is a time when he said, uh, uh, referring to a reporter, someone interviewing him, um, she had asked about his body, and then he said it was like asking me to awaken her or awaken her from the most gorgeous dream. Um, and so, to me, when I was just sitting there and thinking about it, I was I recognized the dream as uh, privilege and how privilege, although it's it's everywhere and you would think that people are aware of it, I feel a lot of people really aren't uh, until they are put into a situation or told by someone else and educated on what that looks like because um, growing up on the other side of the dream, it does look normal. It's very normalized and um, so I really think that that's what he was trying to talk about. Um, and that was why in my, I thought that uh, for my passage um, and it, I had drawn it to um, what I had learned in my, in my education, um, where I was and how, what I was taught of what the dream was is just completely different. Um, like I had, kind of touched on earlier, but yeah. So I think that that's what he had, was um, trying to infer. The dream was this unrecognized privilege. 
Fantastic. Uh, did anyone else want to respond to that one? Demario. Yeah, I'll comment on it. Um, I think the dream is like uh, believing that it's, that it's simple, that America is simple, like you, that you can identify, you can separate people based on what they look like, and that if you just work hard enough, you're going to make it. But I think humans are more complex than that. And I think that uh, like you, you can't, oh, I lost my train of thought. No worries. We can come right back. Uh, did anyone else want to jump in and maybe piggyback on where we got started? All right, I'm going to pivot a little bit. Um, I love the conversation of the dream. I think there's a opportunity to talk about the dream and the privilege that was really, in my opinion, I've also read and, and, and presented this book in the Faculty Learning Center. But one of the things that we talked about is how do we take the text that was found in the book and bring it into our instruction. Um, <clears throat> we have a question that came up and I noticed that numerous of you, numerous of the panelists have actually taught this book. So I guess I would like to ask, um, for those of you who've taught in, the, in your classes, what was the experience teaching this book? Um, how did your students respond? I think uh, some of the comments will probably lean back into comments on the dream. And I think we'll probably get into conversations of privilege as well. So would anyone like to respond to that question? Yes. Hi, okay. Um, I also realized I never said my pronouns. I'm they, she, but I would uh, not prefer just pronouns. Um, so, um, where do I get into the instruction of this book? You know, I think the way I can answer that is go into it doing the work yourself. You know, you can't just go into it and say, I'm gonna teach this book. You know, you gotta educate yourself. You gotta learn what does this book really mean? What What is this book saying? What does, what do, what do these terms mean? Uh, educating ourselves is the most important thing to start off before instructing other students about this book. Um, in regards to how my students reacted when I presented them this, I'm going to be very transparent with y'all. Like, I presented this to my class. About 10 students didn't show up to the whole rest of the unit because it was about race. Mm -hmm. um, and that's going to happen. And you know what? That's the reality I live in. I'm Mexican. I'm a Mexican immigrant. Like, you know, not a lot of people want to hear this. Not a lot of, but nah, not everybody is going to agree with each other. And we have to be prepared for that. And we have to, we have to understand that this isn't also like once we teach this book, it's not their only handbook on racism. Like they need to put in the work as well. Like we need to provide them resources, not just this book. We need to, we need to put in hand handouts. We need to put in like videos. We have to, we have to do all the work. It can't just be this book. And especially it cannot just be a unit. I, um, the way I want to restructure this next semester is to start off my semester by teaching this book and then crafting my course around it. That way people actually understand the connection to it. And maybe it's a little bit easier for students to get into it and not feel like their whiteness is being attacked because a lot of the times our students are white. Um, this is a predominantly white school. So, you know, you're gonna get students who just don't agree with what you have to say. And it's a little bit easier for white teachers to respond to those students who don't agree with that. And they're able to be like, okay, well, let's curb that and let's talk about something else. I, as a white, per or, or, as not a white person can't speak to that, but as a person of color, when students tell me racism isn't real, the only thing I can do is direct them to something else because I can't, I can't put in that work for them. That that's a lot of um, mental strain on myself and on the BIPOC community in general. So this is a great book is what I'm trying to say. Um, all of, but um, reactions to them are very, are varied and you're just going to have to be ready for that. And you're going to have to be prepared for that. Mm -hmm. Wow. I think, um, if I could just like, jump please. Yes. That. Um, and like in regards to like the dream and teaching this book, um, I found that a lot of white students are very comfortable ignoring the themes in this book. And that's because um, by ignoring the themes, they continue to like live in the dream. And ultimately that's what they want. They're what they want like their lives to be easy and um, they don't really wanna do the work. Um, so I also found teaching this book difficult just because it was um, hard to 
first of all, try to get the students to like want to do the work because it's a lot of work. Like you have to like decolonize your mind Mm -hmm. in many ways. Um, And, you know, like there's a lot of like intersection, but, um, but it was, I think in like teaching this book, if anyone else is going to teach this book and you haven't yet, um, one of the things that I would say you have to be prepared for is the fact that students will just try to straight up ignore these topics. And it's really um, like really heartbreaking to watch um, because you want them to do the work. Like you want them to want to like be less racist. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I will say like in regards to the dream, like they'll, they're just comfortable like some of them are just comfortable living in them but I will say also that I did have students who were were really drawn to the book um and who like read the book and felt like they like had finally gotten these subjects articulated to them in a way that they could understand Mm -hmm. um so it's not all bad it's just um there's good and bad pros and cons um and it's just uh it's, it's hard to deal with sometimes, but I also, like, I agree with Lise, like, I think we also as teachers have to put in the work. Um, and part of that work is trying to um, communicate with your students how important these subjects are to understand. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a, there's a bit to unpack there and I have some mental notes of things that I want to try to hit on. But before I jump into that, does anyone else want to comment on, uh, on that? Thank you for that. Anyone else want to all right. Um, if I could, it sounds like there are several points that you brought up. One is that there should be numerous folk teaching uh, and, and doing this work. Uh, and that, and this is something I can relate to. Um, being a person of color, use the term BIPOC, that means for everyone involved, Black, Indigenous, people of color. Um, doing this work as a person of color is stressful and I'm speaking for myself here and that you have to stand up and oftentimes tell a very hard and sometimes dark story about yourself, your grandmother, your mother, your great grandmother your, and your, your forebears. And you have to almost discuss it in a way that's sterile, like, like it isn't pain attached to it. And that's very difficult. But what also becomes difficult is when you almost have to pull out empirical data to back up your story. Um, And it seems like that was some of the things that you're talking about. One of the things that would help is many people doing the fight now, as old African proverbs, many hands make light work. If all of the hands look like mine, then when the story comes out, it's, oh, that's just a black person complaining. But if there are other people who have privilege attached to their skin, who are able to stand up and say, no, these are valid stories. It seems like there is at least the audience would listen a little bit more. And I'm gonna kind of use that to go into a question that did pop up about uh, the audience, the audience of the book, the audience of our presentations and our discussion and I, w- I would like to know, how do you feel that the audience, what, what, what do you feel the role that the audience will play? And this is for anyone in discussion, really for the, 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 the graduate students, the teachers among us who taught this book to talk about it. The fact that you are teaching to a predominantly white audience, what, how do you think that affected things? And, and how do you think that, that affected uh, how, how you taught? And the, the side comment to that is, who do you think Coates wrote this book for? I, I realize that the easy answer to that question is his son. That's how literally how it starts. But it feels like there's more to it. So I guess I wanna talk about the audience for a minute and then I wanna slip back into some other discussions of the context of the book. So this is for anyone who's taught it. Yes, David. I actually didn't teach the book, but um, I did teach Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye in my class. Um, And for my class, I had to really preface that this book is not hard to read. Like it's not like inaccessible, but it is like the content is very difficult to read because there's a lot of violence and I had to give a lot of trigger warning. But I said to them that if, if you can't relate to this story in any capacity, you have to be a witness to it. 
um, you have to, you know, witness what's going on and then it's up to you to understand. And I, well, I'm obviously here to guide you, um, but it, it's up to you to understand why this is happening. And I think for Morrison, uh, her audience is black people. She, she's even said this in multiple like um, occasions, like my books are not for white people, they are for black people. Um, and <laughs> I think Coates is doing the same thing here. I think this is, and like you said, um, Keenan, it's not just for his son, I think it's for the sons of other black men. And I think it's for um, just this budding generation of, of black people coming up in America who has finally found some kind of way, uh, finally found a way to like voice their, um, their dissension, their, their, their anger, their pain in some, in some way, shape or form. And okay. Thank you. That's what I think. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if there's a right answer. I'm just throwing questions out. Uh, anybody else? Um, I, I've been to, oh, sorry, you go. I was going to say, like, I've been trying to get a lot of people to read this book because when I was reading it, it just resonated with me on a really deep level. Like, I felt the depth of it. Like, it, like I have to keep putting it down to soak it all in. And it, I don't know. And then he said that it's probably to the children of other Black men. And maybe that's why it resonates so deeply with me. Thank you. I, I, I'd have to agree with that one. Josie. Um, from the perspective of teaching it, um, I grew up in Miami, right? But I also traveled a lot when I was younger. My father, first generation American, just recently learned how to speak English. Like I'm a first generation American immigrant to this country. My mother was a refugee. And so my social circle growing up was drastically different than that of Marquette, right? To me, it was just, you're from Nicaragua, I'm from Costa Rica, she's from Haiti, they're from wherever it may be. And when we had different conversations about um, experiencing the United States, it, was, it wasn't something that's incredibly foreign, right? And when I entered this classroom, especially in a Zoom setting, and I, of course, understood that most of my students were white, it was kind of like a hitting a brick wall with realizing that they really didn't know about any of this. And it was like, oh, okay. Um, you never you never thought about where maybe the, the origin of birth control is, right? The uh, forced sterilizations, the history of forced sterilizations in Puerto Rico. There's, you know, I personally knew really close friends of mine who were deported. And that was the thing. It was the threat of deportation hung over our heads and understanding that my friends who were darker skin had higher higher chances of being asked for their social security card, you know, are trying to find ways that my friends can find jobs, right, without having to ask for their passport or their ID, right, under the table work. And that's, when I was teaching this book, right, it was a really good opportunity, I think I saw for be able to be able to say like, hey, you know, understand that the way that you understand this country and the way that you've learned about it is biased, right, that we are now, you grew up right? I'm teaching 18 year olds and kind of initiating them into higher education, initiating them into a larger discourse of like, hello, your education system is incredibly biased and you grew up under administration that tolerated white supremacy. And not only that, that white supremacy isn't just a recent administration, it's from the inception of this country. And so many of my students got offended, right? That I told them that. And it was kind of, I had to step back and be like, if you're offended by the things that I'm saying, then it's you. And at the end of the day, I'm not gonna sit here and I don't want you to fight amongst yourselves, right? I had to, there were moments where there was some friction and I saw a lot of them, you know, try to say racism is bad and that was the assignment, right? That they try to turn in work like that. But at the end of the day, I think learning to teach this book in my class was learning that a lot of students, especially now of this generation coming up, like are, learning about the world, right? They're learning about this. And a lot of my, my POC students, right? Then would also like personally message me and say, thank you for speaking about this. This is, thank you for telling me about this. Thank you for, you know, and I'm not in a position to be thanked too. It's just something that should be understood. But I know that like my black indigenous and people and Latina students like felt welcomed. And that was what's most important to me. Thank you. I. I... I appreciate it. I've seen a, a bit of that uh, myself working with my students. Um, I teach introduction to higher education and I, 
I take a, a, a interesting perspective to trying to show how the how how higher education was and is operating. I I show a text that I admit fully is biased. It's not great, but I show and I add in the space the the voices of individuals who've been excluded, and I use firsthand documents. So when I'm teaching about the admissions policies for colleges and universities, I show the letters that were sent to various people, women, people of color, who are literally saying, we're not gonna let you in because you're a person of color or you're a woman, or the letters that were sent to women that specifically said, yes, we'll let you in, but you apply for veterinary science. And are you sure you wanna do that? Perhaps you should consider housekeeping uh, or something like that. So I use that as an opportunity to, to show my students that here's the history or, or someone's perception of the history, but here's a huge voice that for some reason isn't a part of this text and give my students the ability to ask the questions of why. That's my way of doing it for this class. <laughs> other classes, I do it a little bit different, but it's hard. It, it, it's hard for people who've never had to think about the dream, who've never had to think about privilege, and then all of a sudden find out that this is something that's been going on and it's something that hurts. I, in speaking to a student, I compared it to um, growing up, and I, and I try not to make it sound paternalistic, but I did. I said, when you grow up, when you get to your 30s and 40s, all of a sudden you find out stuff about your grandparents or your great grandparents that you didn't know and you may not wanna know. That doesn't mean that Paul Paul's a bad person. <laughs> it just means that you now have more information and that should be incorporated in. I'll use this to slide into some, some more conversation about the dream, um, some privilege, and then we'll transition a bit into some even harder, some topics on um, the body. Um, but Demaria, I believe you had something uh, of a comment about the dream. I want to give you an opportunity to speak back to that. Yeah, uh, I just want to go back and say, like, in America, we speak a lot about our values and what we stand for. We talk about freedom and we talk about democracy and that everyone's equal. But we, if we don't live by these values individually, then we don't value them as a society. And I think really our values are money, power, and how am I going to make it further than my peers? And that's the reality of what it is. And the dream is believing that America stands for freedom, democracy, equality, when based on our history, we see that's never been true. Not for a second, it's never been true. The whole thing is based on oppressing people. That's, what, that's, the, whole, that's the whole basis of America. Okay. And... I think that really goes into a, to Josie's discussion about violence and, and the body. Violence, for those who, who haven't read the text or just speaking to those who have, is a topic that continuously comes up and is usually discussed in the realm of, of the body. Um, the authority to hurt, bruise, damage, kill someone's body, a person of color's body, the agency of that body being destroyed, being placed on the person hurt. So when someone is pulled over and th that, that, that incident ends up in that person's death, it becomes, well, if you weren't resisting, then this wouldn't have been a problem instead of why was I executed for a traffic stop? Um, I don't wanna put words in your mouth, but I know Josie, you did talk about violence in, in your passage. Can you, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, 100%. Um, I found myself consistently, I think, thinking throughout my life, like reevaluating what the definition of violence is. I remember when Trump was running for the first term, right? And it happened in Virginia. And these, they marched around with the Tiki torches, the Proud Boys, the neo Nazis, and this was on a college campus, right, in Virginia. This was in, uh, you could say, a setting similar to NMU. And when this whole like catchphrase, right, punch a Nazi in the face started popping up, a lot of people were saying, violence is not the answer, right? Violence is not, why are you saying? You're, are you promoting violence? Are people promoting violence? I don't stand by that. 
But then what I think shocked me the most about the reaction to a punch a Nazi in the face, like I separate from that, right? Um, was that they weren't more outraged by Sandra Bland, right? Mm -hmm. That they weren't more outraged by Eric Garner, that they prioritized certain acts of violence over others, right? So I don't understand, and I continue to not understand why violence doesn't pertain to refusing to give clean water to Flint, Michigan, right? That's violent to me. And so when we speak about violence upon the body, we need to reevaluate what ha I, we should be reevaluated in discourse. What exactly it means to be violent? Is it violent that there, that there are, are very little black professors at NMU? Is that not violent? Or is it not violent that a lot, a majority of NMU students are white? You know, um, what, what effects does that have in the community? What effects does that have in our economic system? Is it, it's violent to me to look at COVID-19 and, you know, Demario was saying that we do not experience the country the same, right? And we do not all die the same either because of stress, socioeconomic status, Black people and Latina people are dying at higher rates of COVID-19. So that's violent to me, right? Well, our president is saying that our rates don't matter and that COVID-19 is not a big issue. And um, that's violence to me. So when we speak about violence upon the body, we have to understand that like, that it isn't just, don't prioritize a breaking of a window because the breaking of a window is insured. Black bodies most likely are not insured, right? Lives cannot be rebuilt. Once they're lost, they are lost. And by, and I, not to take up too much time, I worked in some sex trafficking in the field when I was back in Miami for my undergrad. And we had to sit down and discuss who are the most victims, like who are the victims of sex trafficking? It's usually black little girls from the age of 12 to 15. And we think, well, what are the concepts? What are the stereotypes of black women? How does that affect those fields? You know, I'm sorry to bring such like an intense subject, but it's true. We have to understand that it is violent that we have these no stereotypes, these misconceptions of whole ethnic groups of people, that there is a systemic hatred and that has effects. That is, that has effects. Most of the people in, incarcerated right now in concentration camps at the border, right? In these ICE camps are black Haitian immigrants. So we have to, we have to think with this distaste, this hatred for immigrants and largely of them are black, like there's, there should not be a cognitive dissonance when speaking about violence. And it isn't, it isn't like a statistic, right? I, I hate that I also have to bring in statistics, but it's true, right? These are real people that it affects and never, never forget that these acts and these beliefs have direct consequences. So to me, I, I, hate, I hate to prioritize when I say something like, well, you know, George Floyd couldn't breathe, right? And then somebody says, well, not all cops are bad. And it's like, stop derailing the conversation. Stop derailing a, a response to violence and condemn the response, but not the, the initial act. Mm. So, yeah. Those uh, are thank, th thank you for bringing that in. Um, to Mario. Yeah, I was, I was just saying, I think a lot of this stuff has to do with, I think, like, as a, as citizens, we don't really understand, like, how we relate to society, because we're so selfish and individually based that we think society is bigger than us, and we don't understand that society is us, like, our ideas make up societal ideas, and I feel like that just goes over everybody's heads, like, they just can't understand that. It's um, it's a hard topic, especially now because we're dealing with um, we're dealing with things that seem to be putting a big neon sign, blinking arrow on systemic oppression and the effects of systemic action, and even in that scenario, just looking at COVID nineteen, there's issue. I hear people talk about COVID-19 and the discussion of why black and brown bodies are dying at a higher rate is completely left out. It's like that's it's blinking. It's right there blinking at you. 
And it's not because the virus has a preference for melanin. And it it's because the vi it's because the individuals involved have lesser access to resources. Why do they have lesser access to resources? It's not because they're walking around saying, I don't like insurance. There are issues that have been going on for generation and generation and generation that have led to one big snowball and coming up and coming an avalanche of issues. And this COVID-19 is the thing that really shines a light on that. But the way that it's discussed eliminates all of that. And it's just, I don't like that I have to be in my house and for God's sake, I need to go to a football game. So it, it becomes very, very hard uh, to deal with that and then to teach in such a scenario of it. Um, I appreciate, Josie, your discussion of violence. I appreciate you bringing up those stories and your, and your previous uh, experiences. I, I want to talk a little bit more about the body and, and cultist discussion of violence, and I'll open it up to you all. Uh, me personally, I like I grew up around white people and I'm light skinned, so I didn't really like think about that kind of stuff. But like, like the only time where I really worried about my body was just recently with this Trump stuff, like seeing these people walk through the streets and I have dreads and I'm just in my head thinking like, what if I get scooped up and killed just because I have dreadlocks and they're like trying to prove a point like this will. This wasn't something that I personally ever thought about before, like growing up. But then now being in the position that I am, it's just like, I don't know, it's a whole new perspective for me. Demario, I'm gonna bring in some previous conversations that you and I have had, and I hope you don't mind. Well, I'm trying to unpack that a bit because I wanted to spell something. You're not saying that because someone happens to have a Republican or conservative ideology, you think they're gonna cause you violence. Right. No, it has, this is nothing to, it has nothing to do with the politics of it, but seeing how these people are cultishly following a man, I understand that they'll do anything to prove a point. Like, I don't, okay. I don't care. I'm not Democrat. I'm not blue. Like, I don't care, but I know that they do a lot. Okay. I, I just wanted to do that because uh, many times the discussion uh, when it comes to politics and especially Trump gets placed in, well, I should be able, I should be able to hold different views on society. And I don't, when I have this conversation, I don't think anyone else here um, put words in your mouth, but feel free to correct me. It's not necessarily about your perspective on capital gains tax. It's that you're following an individual who seems very much okay with violence and violence really being directed towards me. And I am in a situation where I am afraid for my body. Coates talked about this a lot and, and saying there is there there's agency in the destruction. It's my fault that I am in the wrong place at the wrong town uh, sign. I guess that was a Freudian slip because I was thinking about Suntown towns. But um, I, I just wanted to, to speak to that a, a little bit before moving forward, because I wanted to make sure that it wasn't placed in a category, your comments weren't placed in a category of, I just don't like the fact that he has a little, he has a little government perspective. Yeah, no, it has nothing to do with politics. Okay. Um, I want to spend a little bit more time on, you know what? I think that's a good lead in to something else you brought up, Demario, and I'm going to push this to everyone else. I like using media and discussions. I think it helps to, to go through and have very hard conversations. Um, one of my favorite things is to talk about um, race and the, and the realm of discourse. So I'll bring up the fact that Friends, which is a very popular show, was filmed in New York. And season after season after season after season, you just didn't see anybody with a tan. And I would like to say, well, what, what about that is, is unusual? What Use that as a way of talking about things. Uh, Damara, you brought up a, a good movie that I, I would like, that I think it's a really good uh, tool to discuss topics like this. Like this book is a good tool to discuss topics of race. Would anyone else like to make any suggestions of movie? Oh, yeah, okay. 
have so many suggestions. I have a lot of movie book suggestions, like names, if you guys need them. I have recommendations. Angela Davis, look into her. I would suggest watching Moonlight. Uh, Barry Jenkins is the director and that talks about black masculinity. And it, I think it's one of the best depictions about black queer love. And I highly, highly, highly recommend it to anybody who can watch that. If Beale Street Could Talk, the book by James Baldwin, I, you can either read it or watch the movie. It's a short book, but it's really good. And it's in the perspective of a woman. Like, like you know, and it's, um, I don't know, like there's Native Son by Richard Wright. I'm so sorry. I have to go on a tangent and have to say this. If you've never read anything by Richard Wright, please make that your priority this winter term because Native Son by Richard Wright is perhaps it's this is this book he like Between the World and Me is from Richard Wright's poem Between the World and Me so I just highly suggest that if you want to have a better perspective a better understanding of how systemic oppression is violent on a black body just read Native Son you're, you're not you know read Native Son I'm sorry, Moonlight, Native Sun, all of those books, really great. The 13th. And 13th, and it's free on YouTube. 13th, no excuse, it's free on YouTube. Please watch it. Okay, sorry. All right, uh, I'm, I'm gonna throw it to David because I know he is, uh, he, he and I both share the academic crush of James Baldwin. So any, any books and, and movies you would like to recommend? Yeah. Um... My, I, I recommend this book every time, but it's uh, it's probably James Baldwin's like least critically acclaimed book. It's called Another Country. Um, it's a very long, long, long novel. I think it's about 500 pages. So if you have a lot of time on your hands, I recommend reading it because it um, it shows it shows a level of cognitive distance between like a group of people within um, New York at the time. Um, there are many different kinds of pairings, like re like relationship pairings and like um, pairings of lovers, that reveal or like un like show us a type of you know dissonance going on between people and how people perceive race and ethnicity and culture and language. Um, I think it's really a really telling story. That will be a very long. Um, Notes, uh, Notes of a Native Son, the, the like the collection of essays by Baldwin, Stranger in a Village, like I, that's probably out of all of those essays, like please read Stranger in a Village. Um, it's a it's a lovely essay about James Baldwin being in a Swiss village and how is how he is perceived as this very like extraordinary creature, right? Um, the pe little kids run up and touch his hair and his skin and they're surprised that his skin color doesn't rub um, off on them. And then he translates this to um, his positionality in America, how he is this, how he is like uh, signified, you know, his skin is signified as this thing that is violent, it is evil. You know, he says, um, Satan must be black because black is evil. And that's really telling. And then, yeah, that's, I could go on and on about that. And I, I, I don't oh, want to, I... but yeah, please read Stranger in a Village. It's probably one of his best essays. That's very biased by the way. Um, <laughs> no. I appreciate that. I was going to make some suggestions. I've, um, for all the academics and the instructors in the room, I've worked with uh, Lisa, I'm blanking right now. i uh, worked with faculty learning circles and I complete, ah, there you go, Lisa Flood. And I gave her a long list of books that uh, I suggested for, not only for personal reading, but really good to teach stuff like this, because sometimes you want to preside different books to different people. So um, I wanted to bring Aaron into the conversation and into Mario. And did you have any books or movies you'd like to suggest or no? Uh-oh, we're having technical difficulties. We're gonna bounce over to Demario really quickly. Mario, do you have any more uh, books? I'm gonna suggest The Fire next time. Um, which is a play on uh, a more biblical uh, discussion, which is pretty fiery, but um, I think that's a good book for, for folks to read. Um, Demario, you have any other books other than that? Josie? Uh, I just bought a book and it came in the mail today. It's called oh. Cast. It's oh. Like, it's about uh, the caste system in America and how they implemented it in a way that nobody can see it. 
Welcome to the dream. <laughs> Aaron. Um, I'm reading White Fragility right now. Uh, I can't speak much on to it because I just started it. Um, but I've been hearing that that's a really good one. Um, so. Okay. Josie, did you have anything? Um, I recommend an album to listen to, Black Messiah by D'Angelo. It has a lot of powerful civil rights. I feel like it, I was just thinking off the top of my head, a lot of civil rights speeches within the songs. It's also a great album. Um, and one that I'd recommend, I think it would be a book, Normal Life by Dean Spade. It talks about administrative violence, critical trans politics, and the limits of law. So it's a very dense book. It focuses on Black experience, but it also focuses on administrative politics, on trans bodies, queer people, um, and how the laws just like were built to oppress them. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, if you're interested in audio stuff, I am poetry. I have a long list of ones. Any, but right now I've been recommending uh, a couple of poems by Gail Scott Herring. Um, he has a way of putting things, you know, it just, just will make you just sit there and go, oh, dang, like there's one Whitey's on the moon. Um, it, it really puts things into perspective and, and, and talks about the things that are going on in this country and where are we choosing to, to put our money and our influence and our resources. Bringing the conversation back to education, because I think there's a good opportunity for this. I've been reflecting on um, Damari, your discussion about Howard, and I, I really, I placed Howard as a, as a counter space. Um, for those who are not familiar with that term, a counter space is a, is a place where, where various and different ideas can flourish. It, they are often safe spaces by definition that lie on the outside of mainstream educational spaces. They're occupied by members of non-traditional groups. Now in that I'm quoting um, some researchers or researchers, um, Danny Salazaro being one of them, uh, Seiya and Yoso. Um, I'd like to speak about the utility of counter spaces, why they are important and, and, how, and how they are effective. And one, providing individuals from minoritized status, that's basically you, you may not be in the minority, but society has found a way to shove you into a, a lesser than status. How, how counter spaces can be a place of refuge for you. I guess I want to give anyone the opportunity to talk about counter spaces, the necessity of them. And if we got into a conversation about counter narratives, that'd be cool too. Damari. Uh, well, I'd just like to say that I feel like they're important. Like VSU is a counter space because the majority of our lives as black people, we have to move through spaces where we're uncomfortable or we have to be a certain way in order to be there but counter spaces give us the space to be ourselves. Anybody else? Um, we, uh, like my house, we, um, we ended up spontaneously meeting. We're all in our first year of our MFA program, but we're all happen to be queer or BIPOC. And this feels like a safe space to us. You know, like this feels like, the house where we can all come together and cry about anything that has happened to us on a given day regarding our bodies or our race. Um, so creating those safe spaces, especially when you're in like a, an area that's predominantly white, it's so important to have for your mental health, especially because imagine, um, I had an experience with a student who only has white friends and she's uh, a person of color and you know, she's struggling a lot because she's like, I can't have honest conversations with my peers because they don't look like me and they're not going to understand my plight. And um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's an important thing to have, even if you have friends who, who you like and people who understand you having people who look like you and literally understand understand every detail of your 
your life outside of your home and in a public space, like that's important to have. That's that's called community in most right. places, you know, that's just community. And um, we have a lot of community centers, but we don't have these racial community centers for ourselves where we, it's a safe space for us to come into, uh, which is, it's really interesting how that, how community centers work, but safe spaces don't often. Oh, I Sorry. Okay, go ahead. No, 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 please. Also a good space to just learn from other people because we all have different lived experiences that, um, you know, like no one can know everything, right? It's just impossible. And so to have spaces where people like from different walks of life can like talk to each other and um, like validate each other, it's a good place to learn more about the world around you and like, um, like, you know, race and um, language and like sexism, anything. Just so having those spaces, yeah, really important, but not just for like community, but also for learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with BSU, we all like, we have white people that come to our meetings and we have discussions and then we have discussions with like NASA and we have discussions with a lot of people. But I know that if I have these discussions in BSU, I know that like, that I'm safe. I won't get attacked for sharing my views. And uh, I want to uh, wait before I go through and pontificate. Does anybody else want to, to comment on that? I do. Yes, please. I think it's something very powerful also to intentionally create an area and create a conversation where there is no necessity for code switching, right? Um, making sure that your language is different, right? That you won't suffer violence from the way you speak or the way you look, the way you present yourself. That respectability is not something that's prioritized over another person, right? Who is more respectable? Who appears to be kinder, right? When we think about preconceived notions, uh, implicit bias, things like that. And to create a space where, because no, no space is truly safe right? When you think about it, there's always, like, there's been conversations where I've had with people were like, is it, is a space always, is it space actually safe if we're still existing within the United States? Um, and, but I think safety as a subversive practice, right, creating kind of like a place where you and your loved ones, right, who look like you, who talk like you, who are like you, is something that is so powerful, and it's such, it's, it's, a revolutionary in and of itself, right? Because in a country where an identity is politicized, right? Us communing with each other becomes radical. It becomes, um, it be, right? It becomes like, I don't know, it becomes something that is counter. A threat. A threat. A threat. <laughs> so making this threat into something that, you know, is actually filled with love, with community, with care for each other, in and of itself is reactive in and of itself is subversive, right? I come from spaces where like I'm queer, right? I identify as LGBT and we had to go out of our way to make sure, and I went out of my way to make sure that like I could talk to friends and family. There was a moment where my family was just my queer people and those are the only people I talked to and associated with. There was no one straight, no one traditionally white, and it was just all of us together and we created that safety and community for us because if not, who knows what could have happened, right? I, I appreciate all of your stories. I want to speak to some, some terminology and make sure that everyone is on the, on the same page. Um, a safe space is a, a place where individuals who have been intentionally excluded from society in many ways, be they Black, Indigenous, people of color, be they members of the LGBTQ plus community, immigrants, whatever, where they can be. Um, Josie used a comment, uh, a term, code switching. Uh, code switching is not just me, what I'm doing right now. Um, my ability to speak to King's English at the drop of a hat does not come with me getting a PhD. It's something that allowed me to get a PhD. Um, that's something that I don't have to do when I'm not in a professional setting and I don't do it when I'm not in a professional setting. That's far more, so far more profanity that comes out of my mouth. Um, but I understand that it is necessary in order for me to be safe physically, uh, professionally, that I conform 
in a way that it softens me. A safe space is a place I don't have to do that. I can just be myself. Now, that's me figuratively speaking of violence. Safe spaces are also a place where people don't have to necessarily worry about violence the same way they would have just walking around society. I don't have to think about who I hold hands with. I don't have to think about who I show affection to. I can relax and be. To be blunt, I don't always feel like I'm in a safe space walking around Marquette. My wife and I have had many times when we haven't held hands when we wanted to. So it's something that is important when listening to these discussions of safe spaces and counter spaces and, and code switching. These are tools that are used for very survival. And these are tools to, to basically increase the likelihood, not eliminate the threat of, of violence. They increase the likelihood that I will be okay. So I guess I wanted to just put that out there and make sure that was understood. Um, there were some other book suggestions that came in. Citizen is a great book that um, a lot of, um, I remember a lot of people reading that when I was in high school, that was the book that everyone had in their back pocket. And I definitely still recommend it. Um, I haven't heard from David in a while, and I know uh, he probably has some comments on this one. So I'll give it to you for a little bit, and then we'll try to transition to maybe one or two more things before we take leave of everybody. Um, uh, I, I don't know with, because my experience is very, I would say it's very unique. Um, okay. Like I most like I'm a queer person and I'm also mixed race. So like my mother is is white and my father was African American. And you know, most of my life I've been hanging around all kinds of different people. I've also my parents were also in the Navy, so we moved around a lot. So like I've been exposed to like a lot of different people and they have all had very different views um, about about things. And you know and <laughs> you know, I mostly hang around, you know, heterosexual people. That's just, that's just how it ended up. And, you know, and, but a lot of the rhetoric that comes from these groups is deeply troubling to me now that especially like as I'm going through and completing my MA and I'm learning more about not only myself, but, you know, the community I'm a part of, um, both black and queer. Um, I'm learning that all these things that they're saying are very, they're harmful. And I think that, you know, so the, the concept of a space, safe space, has really been like vilified over the last like you know ten or so years, especially with the like the the, the previous administration, and I think that these these places need to be, you know, they need to be um, validated. I think more often, I think that it's very important for for people with a marginalized voice to to get their voice heard in some way, shape, or form, whether it be you know where we're at, because you know I feel very privileged being here, no matter you know. It doesn't matter who I am. I feel privileged being here and right now speaking at this panel and I feel privileged being an MA, but some, a lot of people don't have that privilege. And if, you know, just having like a, a simple space, like let's say like, like BSU or even like something at like, I don't know, a rec center, some anywhere to talk and express to yourself, I think is really important. Um, and I think Coates is really giving us um, a novel or, or a piece, an autobiographical piece that is somewhat of a safe space, even though a lot of the things in it aren't safe to talk about now, but I think that this book is in and of itself is a safe space because he's allowing himself to be vulnerable and say like, hey, hey son, this is the, these are the things that you're going to experience as a black man. Um, so get ready, <laughs> you know? And so, yeah, I think, I think that's. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I know I kind of threw it to you hard there, but you knocked it out the park. Uh, one more, um, I rem I'm reminded of one more uh, bit of poetry. I love poetry. I think it's great. Um, that I think can be a useful tool is um, We Wear the Mask by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. It is some of my top, is one of my top favorite poems. Um, like, like it's that one and then Eagle Trip and it's just like right there by Nikki Giovanni. But um, I like to give the opportunity to go back into uh, instruction because we have a few more minutes and I wanted to talk about some of the, some of the hard uh, topics that I remember coming up in discussion. Um, we were very much considering and, and, and will be considering doing another aspect of this, which involved uh, videos. 
and and that's going to be fantastic and i i hope you all uh really participate in that but i remember viewing two videos from uh, two students who were very upset with uh, some of the things that Coates brought up in this book. Um, uh, David, you mentioned this as saying everything that is put in here isn't something that's easy to discuss. Coates used the topic of September 11th, 9-11 and talking about race. And I like to read the passage because I remember speaking to some of the panelists here and, and they ran into the same students being upset about this passage but I wanna give us some time, some space to, to talk about that respect to the fact that we have to be done in about nine minutes. So I'll try to be quick, quick. The passage starts with Coates saying, we arrived two months before September 11, 2001. I suppose everyone who was in New York that day has a story. Here's mine. The evening, I stood on the roof of an apartment building with my mother, my aunt Sana, and her boyfriend, Jamal. We were there on the roof talking and talking in the site. Great plumes of smoke covered Manhattan Island. Everyone knew someone, everyone knew someone who knew someone who was missing. But looking out upon the ruins of America, my heart was cold. I had disasters all my own. The officer who killed Prince Jones, like all the officers who would regard us as wary, was the sword of American citizenry. I would never consider any American citizen pure. I was out of sync with the city. I kept thinking about how Southern Manhattan had always been ground zero for us. They auctioned our bodies down there and the same devastated and rightly named financial district. And there was once a burial ground for the auctioned there. They built a department store over part of it and then tried to erect a government building over another part. Only a community of right thinking black people stopped them. I had not formed any of this coherent theory, but I did, but I did know that bin Laden was not the first man to bring terror to that section of the city. I never forgot that, neither should you. Later on, just to for the preference, he pretty much says to hell with <laughs> feelings of, of anger and remorse for what happened during 9-11. You know, we have, we have experienced pain. And, and he comes back to um, the fact that Prince Jones was killed with no justification. This was a, a, a passage that many people took issue with. It seemed to place 9-11 uh, in a thing of, well, we don't care about 9-11. I have my response to this, but I wanted to open up for the panelists. Would you like to speak to what he was talking about here? Give some clarification to his words. I just want to say that like, why when it's it's different for white people because they feel terror and then they can do something about it okay. immediately after that happened there was a war a literal war on terror they started a war to end that but black people were in terror we're still in terror <laughs> okay so in that i if i if i hear you right and i, I don't want to soften this at all because i like that but it's basically saying there was justified outrage as a response to that. Numerous thousands of people lost their lives and this was terror. And then Colts in this section was saying the very district that was hit by this act of terror was one that had been a site for terror for black bodies since the creation of this country. And coming back to a really quick quote from a poem, who weeps for us? You know, who, who responds to that pain? So yeah. I appreciate that. Anybody else? Um, I think it also comes back to the way that the black body is not valued as much as the white body is. And so when America like started the war on terror, um, that was valid because white bodies had been destroyed, but there was no um, war against slavery until just because like they didn't want the economy to suffer. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, there was no like, no retaliation against slavery because the terrorizing of black bodies 
didn't matter as much as the destruction of white, white bodies. bodies. I mean, the same could be said about the uh, the drug issues with heroin right now. Now we're dealing with a heroin epidemic when heroin is a very old drug that has been plaguing black and brown bodies for a while. Okay. All right. I'm beginning to see a, a pattern. Anyone else want to dive in on this one, Josie? And it's like, right, our culture has a long history of making bodies property, right? Um, when we have a capitalist system, um, what is valued is labor and property. And you saw the reaction to 9-11 and the burning down of the, I forgot the name of that church in France, the... Mm. Notre Dame. No, that, was it that that's the one that burned down and so many people were outraged, right? It was this huge thing we had to donate to France, right? 9-11, right? These people who, of course, it's remorseful, right? When people die unnecessarily, it, of course, it's something that pains you, but pain is prioritized, right? White bodies and property are prioritized over the bodies of Black, Brown, and Indigenous people and immigrants time and time again. And 9-11 was just a testament to that, right? That so many people are suffering at the hands of our current government system and our current economic system that when a disaster happens to affluent white people, it is something to cause a war over, right? And demonize Muslims, demonize an entire religion, right? This war on terror, and it, it is, allowed them to create war wherever they wanted, to stage coups wherever they wanted, right? So I think a lot of my students, right? So a couple of my students were offended, right? Not a lot, a couple were offended when they read that. And it saddened me because what they took away over it was like, oh yeah, like people don't care when people die. No, it's that white affluent people were prioritized and continuously are prioritized, that their pain deserves and their property deserve more attention than, than the people they oppress. Because no, in my I, opinion, like, so that's why. No, I, I appreciate that. Um, Demario? Yeah, I, I like what you said about bringing in the opioid epidemic. Because they didn't do anything about the crack epidemic, and they weren't going to do anything about the opioid epidemic until it started hitting suburbia. No, and I, I, I it is a good example because it shows. Um, I guess what it, it shows priority. And I appreciate what Josie said because it, 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 it really squashed some issue. It's not that Coates was saying, we don't care what happened during 9-11. It was, it was saying, and I'll speak to more of the comments that happened after 11. People said the country has never been bombed before. No, we have Tulsa, Oklahoma. We, folks were bombed or mass never have we lost a large amount of people like this before and it's like no no we have numerous folk who are hung uh, and not just black folks there are a lot of mexican immigrants who were hung like line them all up or or at and those things were just hard to to work in um i know we're about to run out on time um david did you have anything else on this topic before we have to go yeah, uh, especially going back to like my quote, um, that there is this uh, like authority allowed to do violence upon you and you know, people aren't allowed to, the people literally aren't allowed to react to that. They're allowed to just accept it as it is because you know, obviously they did something wrong or they were uh, resisting arrest in some way, shape or form when we know in a lot of these cases, if not all of them, all of them, um, that that was not true, that the, there was excessive uh, violence used, there was excessive force used and among other things. Um, and, but then we, you know, like uh, valorize uh, the people who died in 9-11, we gl almost glamorize it in this like perverted way saying like, this is a real tragedy. Um, but when black people or brown people or indigenous people or any immigrant dies um, on the street and in like in a senseless crime, hate crime or, you know, vandalism, whatever, um, that's just, that's not, that's not our problem, right? So yeah. <laughs> definitely that's what i got to say on that i appreciate that i am looking at the time that we do need to close but i would always be remiss if i don't give an opportunity to discuss practice so in the last couple and very very quickly i would like to leave that to the panelists how can we take this and do something with it i talk to my students about when they're writing what 
so what and now what what is the topic why does it matter and now what we're going to do about it so how's the so here's the now what now that we talked about this book there are plenty of issues to discuss how do we take this theory and throw it into practice and then hopefully have praxis so any i mean this words is of wisdom? essentially my job and it's the hardest one i've ever had to do it's like we see problems but in order to get people to the point where they can see the problems and then they can help fix the problems there's so much like groundwork that you have to do especially up here like these people have never even had a conversation with black people so i cannot tell you how many meetings how many panels i've been on where i just have to talk about experience like i literally have to just get these people to understand that i'm a person that experiences the world it's so crazy to me uh, yeah go ahead chelsea Hire more black people, don't pay them less. Hire more immigrants, don't pay them less. Create scholarship funds for black students, immigrant students, create, um, ensure, actually ensure that white supremacy stops on campus. That if somebody says white power, that they do not stay on campus. If somebody says slurs, that they do not stay on campus. You know, these actions are difficult, right? Like Demario says he has to like, explain to them that that is an experience that he just like lives and exists right how do you explain that to somebody well then the action comes after that is that maybe you should read right maybe you should understand right expand your experience more right and why should you do that i don't we don't have to tell you why but for people in power you know pay people more like do these these small actions to kind of just like like, I don't know, just do those things, right? There are actually very much like enter a faculty learning circle, right? Where you can sit down and engage in this conversation, come to panels, right? And listen. And then afterwards, maybe don't call the police on a jogger that's in your neighborhood, right? Those are very much things that you can do. Don't now, call somebody a thug for protesting. Those are things that you can do. Now, now, Josie, I'm just going to throw this at you to clarify, because I know you, I know what you meant, but I want you to put it on the record. You're not saying hire someone who's black and brown just because they're black and brown. No, hire them because they're qualified. And statistically, it shows that if your name is ethnic on a resume, a normally for by implicit bias is sometimes bumped down. Right? So understand how implicit bias goes into your hiring process. Acknowledge how implicit bias goes into accepting in colleges, right? If it, it, it hurts me and I want it hurt to hurt other people. When you hear a black student and an immigrant and a Latino student and Native American, when they say, I wanna go into campus to see people who look like me. I don't understand how I can go to a space and not have people look like me, right? And understand that that's violent. So, I'm not saying hire them just because they're that color. I mean, hire them because they're qualified because time and time again, even though that they're qualified, they do not. Get hired. Okay. Anybody else? Um, just finally, um, to add to Josie's point, like if you, if you are in a position of privilege, um, whether you are a, a person of color or a white person, like use your privilege to advocate for those who don't. Like that's the most important thing. The, that's the easiest thing you could do. It's just, spread awareness, um, teach your white students the same, uh, tell them how to show them how to deconstruct their own privilege, because that's also something that has to be touched on. If you're going to be teaching this book, you can't just like throw it at them. And then, you know, they're going to ask you what privilege is and that that I just think put put your money where your mouth is to um, advocate for your uh, black indigenous um, immigrants students especially if they're coming to you for advice if they're coming to you for help because they're not being their needs aren't being met listen to them you know i think that's a that's a big thing that we forget to do is to listen to our students uh especially the ones who don't look like us you know for some reason we we deny that to them so just being more more of an advocate and being more aware and compassionate Anyone else? Well, I appreciate all of the panelists today for sharing your stories, your insight, your lived experiences, the vulnerability that you, you took in doing that. I respect it and I would like to acknowledge it. This is not easy work.
that's one of the reasons that I think a lot of people aren't doing it. So um, I want to appreciate you all for that. Um, Dr. Larson, uh, Larkin, we can throw this back to you and uh, I'll take my leave. Well, I just want to echo what Dr. Colquitt just said. Um, thank you so much to all of our panelists for sharing your expertise and your experience with this book and all of its many complicated contexts. I agree with Dr. Colquitt, this isn't easy to talk about and we're so grateful for um, the time and energy that you put into this panel today. Thank you also to everyone who attended and, and um, for the active listening that you did and the questions that you shared. And I love this final pit bit of the conversation because I think it just challenges all of us to take some time today to think about how we can translate um, ideas into practice. So thank you so much, everyone. And this has been recorded. We'll make it available. I'm not sure where it will be yet, but um, I'll, I'll make an announcement about that soon. But thank you. Thank you.